Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast, where we explore cutting-edge strategies to keep teams human-centered, drive innovation, and empower you with the tools and insights needed to help your team excel and thrive in today's rapidly changing world. Your host is Dane Grunewald, a seasoned expert with over 20 years of experience in enhancing team dynamics and innovation. Quarter one is a great time for renewal in our professional lives. Today's episode offers a wealth of insights for those aiming to enhance their digital savviness and leadership abilities. We're joined by Lorraine K. Lee, who will share her insights on maximizing LinkedIn for professional success, leading impactful virtual meetings and presentations, and effectively building and managing remote teams. Whether you're seeking to elevate your online presence, enhance your virtual communication skills, or foster stronger connections with your team, this episode is your guide to starting the year off with a significant professional edge. Lorraine is a globally recognized keynote speaker, consultant, and instructor at Stanford Continuing Studies and LinkedIn Learning. With over 300,000 followers on LinkedIn and more than a decade of experience leading editorial teams, she's an authority on enhancing professional presence and excelling in virtual environments. Lorraine's work, which spans from teaching organizations how to create engaging virtual presentations to leading remote and distributed teams effectively, has earned her accolades, such as being named a top virtual speaker by ReadWrite and a top 15 LinkedIn expert in San Francisco by Influence Digest. In this episode, we'll uncover, first, maximizing LinkedIn's potential. Discover expert strategies on optimizing your LinkedIn profile, effectively building your personal brand, and connecting with others to expand your professional network. Second, leading meeting and presentations with impact. Gain valuable tips on conducting meetings and presentations that not only capture attention, but also drive engagement and collaboration, essential for today's hybrid environments. Third, onboarding and fostering camaraderie in remote teams. Learn effective techniques for onboarding new team members and nurturing camaraderie among remote workers crucial for building a cohesive and high-performing remote team. So, teamwork makes the dream work, and we're here to inspire your next collaborative breakthrough. Gather your team or put on your headphones, and let's dive in together. Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast. My name is Dane Grunewald, CEO of the Huddle 3 Group. And today I'm joined by Lorraine Lee out of San Francisco. Lorraine is the founder of Rise Learning Solutions. Uh, she's a keynote speaker. And Lorraine is an instructor with LinkedIn Learning and Stanford's Continuing Studies program. So she's doing a lot of great work out there in the community. Uh, and it's going to be great learning more about her story and uh, what it is to supercharge professional presence I've got here. So uh, welcome to the show, Lorraine. Thanks for having me, Dane. I'm really excited to chat. You bet. So uh, I was checking out your LinkedIn profile before the show and you've done some cool work. I saw Prezi was one of your previous employers too, which mm -hmm. I've, I've always been a fan of. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you came to be, you know, growing and, and driving impact in this space. Sure. Um, so I have spent about 10 years uh, leading editorial teams at tech companies. And it was um, actually exactly a year ago that I got laid off <laughs> from Prezi actually. Um, but I had been doing a side hustle um, while I was there doing the speaking, doing the teaching with LinkedIn learning. And I just decided, you know, this is the year that I'm gonna try to be a solopreneur and break out on my own and try to build that side hustle into something bigger. And so I actually, just posted yesterday um, one year of reflections on my journey, um, but that's how I got to where I am today. And as you mentioned, I do the keynote speaking, I consult, I'm teaching at various uh, organizations. And so it's been a wonderful adventure so far. I'm looking forward to continuing it in uh, the next year. That's awesome. And congrats on one year. Thank you. It's uh, interesting that you turned a side hustle into a fully blown you know, job and, and career path. Um, what was it that sort of caught your eye in starting that side hustle and starting to do the work? Yeah, it's funny. I put this in the, uh, the article that I published, but a lot of people when I was in corporate, they would ask me like, Lorraine, do you ever think about wanting to become an entrepreneur or doing your own thing? And I would just say, you know, like I like the stability of corporate. I don't really feel like, you know, an entrepreneurial path is for me. I've always been in corporate, right? At, at you know, reasonably large tech companies. Um, but then I realized corporate is not that stable, you know, all the layoffs happened. And so um, I had been, you know, doing this side hustle, but it's, you only have so much time in a day, right? So you can only build yeah. it just so much if you want to still have weekends and time to, you know, spend time with friends and all of that. And this year, a lot of personal things were going on. So I got married. Um, a few of my girlfriends got married in Europe just 
for whatever reason, just a lot of weddings in Europe, yeah. um, a lot of travel planned. And so I figured you know, this would be a nice year to try to, ha to have that flexibility and try to kind of build that foundation um, for the business. And hopefully, you know, with family and, and all that coming later um, to have that foundation set and then to keep building on it as life continues to get more hectic. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. I heard a great uh, podcast that one of my friends runs uh, this morning. Um, and they were talking about entrepreneurship and how mm -hmm. a lot of people have traditionally been afraid of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. because they felt corporate was more stable. But in the yeah. last couple of years, yeah. we've seen that change dramatically. And, uh, and and that's a big reason I'm fascinated by the future of teamwork because I think the future is lots of small teams playing well together. So a lot more entrepreneurship, hopefully, mm -hmm. where you know, you rely on yourself and your team members for your stability and not a large organization that you, yeah. you don't have a huge amount of control over. Exactly, exactly. Times are changing. <laughs> they sure are. And and on that point, you know, LinkedIn is a, a huge um, resource for, for professionals, for teams uh, within organizations, across organizations. I've, I've been fascinated uh, in my journey with LinkedIn, you know, starting out as a recruiter and then moving into more the content space and learning. Mm -hmm. um, what, what was it that first really uh, captured um, sort of your spark and attention in, in the LinkedIn platform? Yeah, um, it was actually in college. I think that's when maybe LinkedIn was starting to gain traction. And I've always just been someone, even in college, like all my favorite classes were the pre-professional classes, the very like real world, tangible skills classes. Um, and LinkedIn came out, I was obsessed with, you know, at the time you could only, you only had the profile, right? You didn't have all the content yeah. and all that. So obsessed with filling out my profile. Um, LinkedIn was always a company that I actually really wanted to work at. And I ended up meeting at a barbecue, um, the future chief of staff to the then CEO, um, Jeff Weiner. And yeah. he was so impressed with my profile <laughs> and he, you know, I had applied to a role at a company called SlideShare, which LinkedIn owned at the time. And they pushed my resume through and I ended up getting the job at SlideShare and then later moved on uh, to LinkedIn proper. And so um, obviously I loved LinkedIn before and then I worked at LinkedIn for six years, continued to love it and yeah. was a founding editor of the team. So, you know, we were really crucial and um, instrumental in building out all the content pieces like the LinkedIn influencer program, the LinkedIn news stories you see in your feed in the top right hand corner. I actually moved to Hong Kong for a year um, to help Fun. kind of build that. So I'd be during my day typing up the news. And then in the US, you all would wake up and have your news ready <laughs> in the morning. That was me. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I just, you know, I've always really appreciated it. I've always been very professionally focused. Um, I really realized over the years the value it provides in allowing you to build your personal brand, to have kind of that thing that you own outside of a company, right? So you always yeah. will have your brand no matter what. Um, and then also just a really wonderful place to meet other people. So actually, the person who introduced me to you, Dane, uh, Jenny Wood, met her through LinkedIn. I think she just sent me a cold outreach message. And I was like, this woman looks amazing. And we chatted and then we ended up meeting in person. So just a lot of relationships built out from there. Yeah, the relationships are massive. Um, it is, it's an amazing platform, and you're probably going to know the numbers better than I do. But everything that I hear is when you look at the, the millions of uh, users on the platform, mm -hmm. there aren't that many people that are regularly active. So it's it seems to be yeah. He untapped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the latest. So there's actually one billion members now, which is crazy. Uh, they just hit it like a few weeks ago, and then um, there's about I think. Each month, oh, I'm already forgetting the stat. It's it's like one percent of like their monthly active yep. users are posting content. So still a lot of opportunity there. Still a lot of people not posting content or just still thinking, oh, LinkedIn is just when I or just to use when I need a new job. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so that that kind of leads me into some interesting questions. You know, you you said you yourself said even with Jenny, you get to build relationships in mm -hmm. LinkedIn. Um, when it comes to LinkedIn presence, you know, mm -hmm. how do uh, professionals, um, teams, it, it, I, I guess it's all through the lens of the professional, but they can be talking about themselves or their team or their organization. Mm -hmm. How do they start to create visibility? Where are some practical tips there? Yeah, so I would think of your LinkedIn profile. I always like to say it's your online landing page. And so many of us, if we get 
outreach from someone or we just meet someone new at a networking event in person, like we'll always go to their LinkedIn, right? To get a better sense of who yeah. they are and to yeah. assess them, you know, their credibility and all that. So filling out your profile first is just the really foundational thing that you should do. Once you have that, then that's when you can start creating the content, um, reaching out to people to try to connect. Um, but I always like to say, like, start with the profile first, make sure it's really complete. Um, you know, a lot of people, for example, are still not leveraging their background cover photos. They're just using the LinkedIn kind of stock template yeah. photo, which doesn't tell me anything about you, right? Um, yeah. Or they have very simple headlines. So it'll be, you know, um, job title at company, and that's all they put. But we have 220 characters for a reason. You know, they want you to fill it out. It helps you be discovered in search, lots of yeah. good stuff. And of course, yeah, you keep going down the profile, a lot of kind of nuances and things to fill out and to kind of enhance that that um, your brand and also just your credibility and just showing your experience. That's neat. And so once you've done that visibility building with the mm -hmm. profile, mm -hmm. Um, I saw one of your posts the other day, which was like, don't just say love it or great, like <laughs> actually engage, share your point yeah. of view, answer questions. So, mm -hmm. so does the way you interact with posts then drive, you know, the algorithms bring your profile a little further up? Yeah. So you touch on a really good point, Dane. So LinkedIn, again, like there's the content piece, but LinkedIn is really focused now around um, community and conversation. So not just the job searching site. And so commenting and interacting with other people's posts are going to be a really big part of that. So I always like to say for people who might be nervous posting, you know, under their own name, people get very yeah. nervous to do that. Start commenting first and adding value through your comments. They're like kind of like mini posts. Um, I don't know yeah. mini is the right way, but just like alternative posts or like posts adjacent where you can add your own opinion, add your own insights. It's a little bit less in your face coming from your own profile, but it will help you um, get more seen by others, mm -hmm. right, in your in your network. And then also, um, when you do decide to start posting, those comments that you made are going to help boost your post in the algorithm because LinkedIn does look at commenting as a really big um, influence on, you know, the algorithm and kind of how active you are and like how helpful you are in the community. Um, and so the post you were referencing, I, I said a lot of people on LinkedIn, they think commenting is saying like, love it, or I agree, or just very simple comments, but you really want to add your own area of expertise, your own opinions, your own experiences. Um, and I like to say aim for about 15 words to have, you know, I feel like 15 words, it's kind of a substantial comment. So that's a good goal um, to aim for. Nice. And when you look at other social media, LinkedIn has its moments, but you look at some other platforms mm -hmm. and there's a lot of conflict mm -hmm. in, in the post, probably more X and some of those others have a yeah. bit more of that going on. Um, you know, how much does taking a provocative or a conflicting point of view um, harm or hinder an individual? Like where, where does that sort of play? Yeah. I mean, my I only post on LinkedIn right now. Um, yeah. I think I think it's okay to post those viewpoints. And the reason is it's because it's attached to your professional identity. So you have to just feel comfortable if yeah. you can stand by what you want to say and what you're putting out there. It's fine. You know, that's your opinion. Um, you know, LinkedIn is the, the great thing about it being connected to your professional identity is like there's an added layer of hopefully respect and just screening. Like if you want to have a crazy thought and put it out there, just yeah. assessing like, do I really want this attached to my name and my picture and my company and all these things? Um, so that's one of the good things about LinkedIn. I think it kind of tampers down that. Um, that's a great point. Yeah. That just like craziness of people just wanting to like yeah. scream and shout and just say, you know, crazy things. Yeah. 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 No, that's a great point. And, and it's a good um, reminder to people who are starting Mm -hmm. You know, yes, you can delete posts um, yeah. <laughs> these days, but uh, it's still better to try and kind of slowly build up, start with the comments, then your yeah. posts. Yeah. F find, find your, uh, I mean, you're going to have a level of expertise and uh, interest in certain domains anyway, but you got to try and find your voice, I guess, mm -hmm. over time. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's neat. And video. Um, one thing I've found, Lorraine, you might know a lot more about this than me. Uh -huh is that I can, I can have a great conversation with a guest like you and I can put a little piece up. But if I uh, dress up in a costume and have a video of me surprising a child or mm -hmm. 
let my let my daughters paint my toenails for some reason that <laughs> tends to get way more impressions than anything yeah, smart yeah. <laughs> that I say out there like where's where's that coming from I think there's just been a shift um especially since we all went remote from COVID yeah. just you know people feeling okay showing more of their personal life showing the behind the scenes showing the cute and funny moments like with their family or with their pets and all that um so yeah, there have been complaints that LinkedIn has gotten a little bit too much like Facebook. I think yeah. LinkedIn is adjusting its algorithm accordingly to kind of, you know, reward people who are experts in, within certain topics and all that. But yeah, I think it's I think it's good, though, to share personal posts every now and then. Like the posts I mentioned I shared yesterday about my one-year reflections on my solopreneurship journey. Mm -hmm. I posted a funny picture of me in my wedding dress, you know? Like that's something that no one else, no one would have seen normally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so just, I think just showing that side of you, it helps people connect with you, especially if you're trying to be a content creator and like build an audience, build a following. People want to feel that, yes, they're learning from you, but also that they feel connected to you. That's neat. So when you're supercharging professional presence, the degree to which you might share some of those more personal or fun moments, th does it depend what sort of profession you're in? If you're in a very serious scientific profession, do you yeah. find that you tend to be a little different I, in what you put out? It might be. Like I feel like finance people, you know, they're a little bit more yeah. buttoned up and their company might not even want them to post on LinkedIn, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like definitely tech, like people are very open, I feel like with sharing those things. Um, but yeah, you kind of, you know, use your best judgment, understanding your industry, understanding, um, you know, what your manager's opinion is, like what, who your team is, like all of those things have an effect. Yeah. <laughs> neat, neat. Uh, and when you're supporting professionals to, to build their presence, mm -hmm. another big part of just building your visibility um, is how you develop your network. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you find um, people can evolve their professional network in yeah. a meaningful way? You know, there's, yeah. there's, a, there's always an audience you want, an audience you get, mm -hmm. and they're not always aligned. Definitely. I think it's really important to feel okay reaching out to strangers. I feel like, and again, it's like, it's, you know, we'll, we'll talk about LinkedIn since we are talk, uh, we're on the topic already. I think a lot of people think of LinkedIn as, okay, I'm going to connect with the people I met maybe at a networking event in person or just someone I've worked with before, but really connecting with strangers is where the magic happens. Yeah. And so there's a little hack that I will share um, with your audience. If you um, click connect with someone on LinkedIn, what a lot of people do is they connect and they send the request and then it shows up in my connection tab and I have no idea who this person is, right? Instead, you click connect, you will see a button that says send a note. Mm -hmm. Click that. It's not too many characters, um, but you know you have enough to write a few sentences saying who you are, why you're reaching out to that person. Um, doing that does not use up any in mails. You do not need a premium account, but just that little tweak um, makes it just so much more likely that that person is going to accept your connection request and want to build a relationship with you, right? Because you're you're giving them a reason, like oh, I'm I follow your content, or I want yes. to learn more from you, or what you said here really you know interested me. So. Um, reaching out to strangers and, and not being afraid because I know a lot of people like rejection is a scary thing and some people might reject you and it's fine. Like who cares about those people, you know, in the end you reach out to a lot of people. Most people, if you send a nice and polite message, um, will accept. The nice thing about rejection in LinkedIn though, is that, uh, often you don't see it. It's yeah, just, yeah. they just ghost I'm, you. Like actively like searching their name again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to send you the, the sorry. Notes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I like that power of reaching out to strangers and, you know, in a virtual working world where, um, I mean, so much has changed. It's not just virtual, you know, we're living in a much more global economy now mm -hmm. too. Reaching out to strangers for a perspective on something that's happening in your industry mm -hmm. or something yeah. like you said that you've seen in their post, mm -hmm. people people seem to be more and more willing, mm, uh, particularly yeah. in that platform, to to collaborate. It seems like the stakes have been lowered and it's, yeah. it's a safer place to, to share ideas and thoughts now. Yeah, that's a really good point. I've been reaching out to a lot of um, L&D leaders and ERG leaders and marketing leaders just trying to understand um, what are their challenges going into the new year, you know, what um, upskilling, you know, topics are important to their teams. And of course, like having that strong professional presence on LinkedIn and that full profile helps a lot. But 
I mean, I think the majority of people are like agreeing to get on a video call. Like they have no yep. idea who I am and it's just become so much normal to meet people over video. So that's been a really nice thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's neat. Actually, one of uh, my teammates, uh, when he was transitioning from uh, the military into the business world, I think one of his coaches said, go and do 50 cups of coffee. Just reach out to people on LinkedIn in fields yeah. that you want to work in and just yeah. do a virtual cup of coffee. And yeah. he had great success in doing That's that. And it's, yeah. it's something that you couldn't do uh, when everyone was in the office because, number one, you'd have to be getting in a car or on a train or a bus yeah. and going around a whole bunch of people people and places exactly yeah oh that's yeah. great that's super cool so that's kind of how to evolve your professional network and reach out to people mm -hmm. when you do think about probably the last question on that mm -hmm. when you do think about the the war for talent that we've seen mm -hmm. over recent years mm -hmm. um even this year has been tough this last year as you said about layoffs mm -hmm. in the tech sector and, yeah. and other sectors there's still a shortage of good people for the right roles that often there's a Mm -hmm. displacement that mm -hmm. means they're not easy to connect. Yeah. Um, we're seeing a lot more evidence that uh, candidates, job seekers, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in some of these professional roles that are more active on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. are very heavily drawn to the manager. Um, you know, they'd like to learn more about the manager that they're interviewing with. So they might be checking their profile before the interview. Um, maybe even later stages when they're getting an offer and they've got a couple of offers, are they mm -hmm. weighing up not only the company they're joining, but yeah. who are they going to work for and how does that person show up on a place like LinkedIn? Yeah, that's smart of them. <laughs> yeah, it is. The manager really dictates your experience. So, <laughs> Big time. So do, yeah. you see, do you see any uh, evidence in the people that you're coaching or working mm -hmm. with that they're building – their story of like how they manage and who they are and how they work with teams. Are you seeing more or less of that content? Um, I don't know if I'm seeing more of it. Um, I do feel like there is a shift generally towards more transparency um, with people just sharing like their working style. So there's something um, I created. I don't know if um, Dane, you're familiar with this concept, but something called a readme or a personal operating manual. And oh, so I when I was a manager, I created this and it just very explicit, like, this is how I manage. This is my communication preferences. These are all my communication quirks. Like, you know, if I send you a Slack message, I want like an emoji to know that you saw it. And this is yep. how I give feedback. This is how I like to receive feedback. Um, this is how I want to like support your goals. Here are my, just like very detailed. Um, and so I feel like uh, I'm just seeing, yeah, like more conversations around being transparent in how you lead. I think yes. and like doing things like that. Um, and I know like whenever I post about the readme and I have mine online as well, if people, you know, want to see people seem to get excited by it and resonate by it. So I am happy to see that. I do remember too, there was this one post. It's not something I see very often, but one post by a manager, they posted the job description and, and then I think there was like a readme type document attached to the job description saying, these are, you know, this is me as a manager. I thought that was that was wonderful. It is. I think uh, if we're really honest, very few job descriptions are ever written to accurately reflect what the, what it's like to do the job. You mm -hmm. know, it's a bunch of tasks and responsibilities, yeah. but it doesn't say anything about how you're going to work yeah. in that team or mm -hmm. in that organization or with customers. So yeah. that's a great ad. I hadn't thought about doing a, um, a readme or a user operating manual yeah. uh, in that environment. So I'll definitely get online and check yours out too. Yeah, please. <laughs> That's cool. All right. Um, I saw on your profile here that you also do work in designing impactful meetings for productive and happy teams. So that mm -hmm. one jumps off the page because we've all been, uh, you know, suffering a little bit with the volume <laughs> of meetings. <laughs> Or suffering not a to lot. Be too dark. <laughs> You're being nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Suffering a lot with a lot of meetings um, because yeah. it's easy now to go yeah. from meeting to meeting to meeting because you're yeah. not getting in that car. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about how you work with individuals and teams to, to get that meeting design right. Yeah. Um, so I've created a lot of different frameworks um, around meetings. I have a keynote about meetings that has been quite popular. Um, you know, something I created called the Passive to Active Meeting Framework. And uh -huh. it's a very simple framework to follow for meeting facilitators, um, but clearly a lot of people are not doing it. Um, so the steps are to warm up, 
the audience, so to speak, to invite them into the conversation, yep. to make sure you pause long enough to let people think and actually mm -hmm. respond. Um, and then to listen and observe when people start responding and, you know, to show that you're actually valuing what they say and listening carefully. And then to interact. So, you know, ask questions, um, engage with them, the person who's speaking, and then you start back at the beginning. Um, but one of the things I would say, you know, that a lot of people are missing in meetings is that warm up piece, starting yeah. the meeting off with the right energy. So I always like to say that meeting facilitators are entertainers now, like half entertainer, yeah. half facilitator. Um, and so you really have to kind of start off the meeting on the right foot um, with that energy and, of course, have all the, you know, essentials down, like the agenda, for example. Um, yeah. that I like to share, you know, things like that to get people thinking a little bit more strategically about meetings. It's not something you just show up to and kind of wing it and just hope that you end up with the right outcome. There's a lot of like very specific things you need to do beforehand, during, and then after the meeting as well. Yeah. I actually uh, had a guest uh, on a show that we were shooting earlier this week and she shared that uh, the more you prepare shows the more you care about the, oh, the team. Oh, nice, yeah. And I like that because it's easy to remember. When yeah. Right. But oh it's gosh, true it's so to your true. point. So if true, you prepare yeah. that opening warm up and the agenda and mm -hmm. how am I going to invite people in and how mm -hmm. am I going to take pauses, how am I going to invite not only – interaction between myself and the speaker but interaction between two other people in the meeting like mm -hmm. there's there's an art as well as a science to all of that there is yeah and i think a lot of people maybe get intimidated or just get you know don't want to bother with it because it does take a little bit more time but put in that little bit of extra time and you're not going to need 10 extra meetings to get to the you know goal that you wanted in that first meeting right yeah the reason yeah. we keep having all these follow-ups is because people are not focused and um, intentional about that initial meeting when they set it up. Yeah, definitely. Any uh, thoughts on like how to balance the frequency of meetings? A few things come to mind. So the first thing I would say is to leverage asynchronous communication. Mm -hmm. So for anyone who's not familiar, synchronous communication is um, communication that you expect kind of that immediate back and forth, like in real time. Whereas asynchronous is not dependent on time. So um, like email, for example. Yep. And so I think a lot of people could benefit using asynchronous communication um, before meetings, you know, have a Google Doc and say, okay, let's, or even before you schedule the meeting, right? Like have a Google Doc, have people add their feedback, their comments, you'll get everyone's, you know, thoughtful opinions because they are tackling it at a time that works well for them when they're most productive yep. and they're tuned in versus a forced meeting that they have to be at. Um, and then I've, something I've done is I have asked my team before do you want to do this live or do you think we can do this async? And almost all the time people want to do async and, wow. and it works, you know, and you're giving people the option and, you know, if it doesn't work, then maybe you reevaluate and <laughs> go back to live. But I always think starting off with async um, is a really solid strategy. I like that. Uh, it's interesting. Last year we had Kian Gohar on the show and he and Keith Ferrazzi wrote a book about, you know, how the world of work's changing. Mm -hmm. Um, which talked a lot about asynchronous meetings. And mm. one of the things that they shared about the asynchronous meeting is that it's a far more inclusive format because yeah. you might be someone who's whip smart and quick and mm -hmm. bold and you'll just share your thoughts in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I might be someone who's more um, introverted, considered, yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe a little bit cautious or shy about Sure, or do yeah. I really want to say that? I don't know who's in the room. Mm -hmm. So it, it gives different people time in which to uh, assess how they want to contribute. And even it, it actually allows people to team up and say, you know, hey, Lorraine, I'm, I'm thinking of making this contribution, but before yeah. I put it out to the group of eight people, what, what, what can you tell me your initial reaction is to this? Yeah, so true. And I'm in that introverted camp. Right. And, and to your point, like both groups can be whip smart. Right. But they, yeah. just, they just think through things differently. And so, yeah, you're Good giving point. that space for everyone to kind of contribute in the most optimal way possible. Yeah, no, that's very cool. And then as far as how many meetings, is there a rule? Do you do you see a view on only so many meetings per day or, you know, more more short meetings versus a couple of large meetings? Do you see anything in that? 
I do. I think um, there's no like optimal number that comes to mind. I think for me, like a team meeting once a week, right, to connect and talk yep. about team matters. But I, you know, I always come up with an agenda ahead of time, and I ask my teammates to contribute. And if no one has anything con to contribute, and I don't have anything to say, like people would prefer to have that time back. So just cancel it. And that's like one of the benefits of having the agenda is that you're actually structured and thinking like, does this meeting really need to happen? Like, what do we actually need to talk yeah. about? And yeah. then there are like tools I use, for example, like I've used clockwise um, quite a bit to right. create focus time on my calendar. And I usually like to try to have free time in the afternoons and my meetings in the morning just to get them out of the way. That's my own personal preference. No, I, I think that's important too. And we all, we see, particularly when we're working across time zones, you talked earlier about working in Hong Kong. Um, we don't always have the, the luxury of kind of setting our schedule, but we should yeah. definitely be buffering and blocking time where we say, this is my focus time. This mm -hmm. is my non-meeting time yeah. and sharing that with the team because uh, it's nothing worse than a day when you go back to back for eight hours and you miss lunch. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I literally had, I've had, um, like, I had a meeting with someone scheduled today, and she didn't show up, and I, I messaged her, so is everything okay? Like, what happened? She's like, oh, my God, I just had, you know, a, a crazy day of meetings, like, everything's been running over, and I'm so sorry I missed it, but, like, that shouldn't be a thing where Ever. it's just so just crazy like that, that you're not even remembering, like, other commitments, and that meetings are running over. That's another thing, ending meetings on time, and just being respectful yeah. of people's time is important. A lot of facilitators... Uh, are not focused on that so much. <laughs> Starting yeah, and ending I, on time, yeah. I can see that actually. And it's it's tough because you, you're right in mentioning the professional sort of courtesy and respect. Mm -hmm. um, everyone's busy, not just at work, but in their home lives, particularly when they're working virtual. So we've mm -hmm. got to, you know, if I'm taking this call right before I get in the car to go and pick up a child or go mm -hmm. to the gym or walk mm -hmm. the dog, the, the, the stress at the end of the meeting can be palpable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's neat. Uh, and video, have you seen, I guess video is another way of doing asynchronous yeah. meetings, giving people updates. It's a different way to engage. Mm -hmm. But a lot of professionals aren't very comfortable getting on video. I, yeah. I guess there's a self-consciousness that's bubbling up there. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But it's important, though, to learn. And like, the really good thing is that video can be a learned skill. I teach it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, and I had to learn it as well, you know, myself at the start um, of COVID. And so the thing is, is like video can be a really big differentiator when you know how to present yourself confidently on camera, like when you look presentable and professional, um, people, like subconsciously or otherwise, like think more positively of you and have a better impression of you. Yeah. Um, so just making sure that you take the time to learn. Like I think a lot of people are like, okay, I know how to, you know, join a Zoom call and therefore I know how to be have on video and like have a good video presence. But there's a lot of you know little things that go into it. It's not it doesn't have to be a super complicated thing, but there are certain things that you have to think about, um, you know, before getting on a video call or present or doing a video recording, for example. Um, yeah. One thing I've heard, I don't know if you've seen this as well, Dane, is that a lot of company leaders, like more senior leaders who record videos for like all hands meetings or whatnot, um, don't present themselves very well on video. Uh -huh. I'm not sure if that's a trend that you've seen, but that's just something I've been hearing, which has been interesting. It's good they're trying to do more of that, but um, they still need a little bit more of the training, I think. Yeah. And and tell me about the types of training you do. Is it is it about preparation and scripting? Is it about uh, where your eyes go on the video? Like, it, mm -hmm. what are some quick tips? Sure. Um, so actually, the course I just finished teaching at Stanford Continuing Studies was all about virtual communication. So I had a course on establishing your virtual and video presence, a, um, a course on uh, virtual presentations, and then a course on virtual meetings. So these are all like three very essential elements, I think, um, to the virtual workplaces. Uh, so some quick tips. Um, yes, eye contact, that's of course a big one. Like in person, when we shake hands and have that skin to skin contact or make eye contact, we're releasing oxytocin, which is a social bonding hormone. On okay. video, the closest way to get that is to create eye contact on camera. Uh, also curating your background is important. So yes. making sure that you don't have a messy bed behind you or just, you know, whatever it is. Um, yeah. I know, you know, some people are limited in their space and, you know, where they can set up exactly. Um, but really, you just need that six feet of space behind you looking good. 
you know, the rest of my, my room right now, you don't want to see it's messy. <laughs> <laughs> Just that six feet of space behind you. And then there are also hacks too. Like um, you can have like a room divider behind you. Or I had this coworker who worked in the kitchen and I think the pantry was behind him, but he hung like a curtain behind him. So it was just a kind of a solid, you know, color behind him. So that was um, a good trick to kind of make it look a little bit more presentable. So yeah, yeah, those two things, very important. And then you probably see me using a lot of hand gestures right now. That's also really good to just help connect with the other person and just add a little bit more energy into the call. Um, as we you know, mentioned before, like energy um, gets muted on camera, you know, similar to meetings. So you really need mm -hmm. to be a little extra, a little more extra than you think. <laughs> Bring a little extra. It's interesting because uh, at the same time in early public speaking courses in high school, I was told to like take a take a comfortable stance and not be throwing my arms around all mm. the time. But if I'm honest, if I think about when I'm best presenting, whether it's yeah. on video or on stage, yeah. I like to I like to walk around and engage with <laughs> people. So uh, I guess different people are going to have slightly different styles and appetites for, yeah. for some of that too. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to be like up here, but I think like moving yeah. around kind of, you know, that, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's very neat. Um, and script. So a lot of people get caught up with reading. Mm -hmm. um, other people love prompts. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, do you see a golden rule in, um, you know, talking from uh, memory or, or key points versus going yeah. off a tight Are, script? Yeah, I think I think writing out a script is. I, I assume you're talking about presentations. Um, yeah. Writing out a script, I think, is always a good idea, just so you have a general sense with what you want to say. But memorizing is never a good option, and that's when people can really get in trouble because if you memorize something and then you just forget what that next line is or forget what that word is or trip up, it's going to th completely throw you off. Um, so write the script, pra just practice a lot, a lot, a lot. Like I think the yeah. golden rule that my um, speaking mentor taught me was for every one minute of presentation, you practice an hour. So a 20 minute, wow. it, you know, if you're kind of getting on the stage, 20 minute yeah. presentation, 20 hours, right? And that will, will have you really internalizing the content so that you don't need to memorize and that you're really comfortable with the content. And it'll change a little bit each time. But you get yeah. to that point where you're so comfortable that you don't, I mean, you don't need to memorize. It's just you know the, the main points that you want to make. And then yeah. you, just, you just speak naturally, right? Because you're so familiar with it. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. I did a, a stage uh, presentation a couple of years ago. Uh, we co-sponsored actually an event with uh, Milestone. Uh, one of our insurance brokers here, and we brought Daniel Pink in, which was a great day. Oh, yeah. Um, but I was super nervous because, like, I've been up on stage for my own company events, but not up on stage for an external audience with a, a big speaker following. Yeah. Um, so I found that not only did I do probably the one hour to one minute of practice, but I recorded myself a few times. Mm hmm um, and then when I was driving to work, I'd listen to myself oh delivering my gosh, it. I've done that too, yeah. <laughs> and it, that was powerful. And it gave yeah. me this kind of sense of confidence and I knew where I was slipping or not hitting the note yeah. or not pausing. Mm -hmm. So the, it's amazing the way that the technology we have now gives us these kind of extra tools. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good strategy, I think. Okay, cool. So we've talked about uh, effective virtual meetings. We've talked about building the LinkedIn pros presence. Um Productivity in a remote environment, that was another mm -hmm. topic I wanted to dive into with you. Mm -hmm. um, we've heard the horror stories of people putting these uh, productivity measurement softwares down oh, and, gosh, and, yeah. and then staff having to like leave a like uh, the kitchen mouth. implement yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> kitchen implement on a key or whatever they've got to do to get around the hack. But, but uh, how do you kind of measure and boost productivity without micromanaging and, and running your best people out of town? Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, well, if a company is making you do something like that, I feel like it's time to look somewhere <laughs> else. Um, but what I would say is, you know, if you're a leader with a remote team um, or a distributed or hybrid, like you really want to focus on outcomes, mm. not how much time people are at their desk. And this will also help with things like proximity bias. So for hybrid offices, like proximity bias is a very real thing where you favor the people you see who are closest to you. Um, so if you focus on outcomes, it's going to be more performance-based versus, oh, I see you in the office all the time and we're buddies and, you know, I really like you and I'm going to assess your performance on that. And so I think, um, yeah, the outcomes is a really big piece of that. And to your point, like, as a leader, like, you do not want to be micromanaging your team. Like, trust yeah. is such an important thing. 
And trust is what will make your team more productive, will make them happier. Um, micromanagement is just like a way to just quickly turn them off and just and, and just not feel good about working with you. Yeah. No, I like that outcome approach. And it's interesting. We worked with uh, Carl Cox, who was also a guest on the show from mm-hmm. 40 Strategy. And he talks about leading indicators versus lagging indicators. Often when you're looking mm-hmm. at metrics, you're looking at stuff yeah. that's been done. How many emails did you send? How many of this? Mm-hmm. But the leading indicators are like, what are those key outputs that you yeah. do that drive productivity? Yeah. Um, and he had a great example of a charter school uh, principal, head teacher, mm-hmm. And they were looking at how to run admissions and they worked out that the most important thing to look at was how many um, new families coming onto campus Mm -hmm. was he able to shake hands with Mm. because that would create a really good first impression and those people would Mm -hmm. then, you know, continue their tour with a a more positive mindset. Ah. Um, Now, I know no one was managing him, but it's a good example of finding those those important things that our team members do, whether they're yeah. remote, yeah. distributed, or hybrid, and and just saying, hey, how many of these have we done this week, and mm-hmm. and not not diving into the data or the monitoring in in too heavy a way. Yeah, one other thing I would add, if you're trying to increase productivity, is the flexibility piece of it all. So we talk about remote or hybrid, which is very um, location dependent. Flexibility, I feel like, is the next frontier of work where it's yeah. really time. You know, depends on are flexible on time. So, um, you know, I could be someone who's a night owl and I'm most productive in the evening. Yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll have a few hours of overlap with my team or my manager, but, you know, let me work in the evening. I'm going to get a lot more done. I'm going to be my best self. Yep. And so that takes a lot of trust, um, you know, but uh, I think it's the, the way of the future for, you know, for the teams who want to be high performing and, and who want to, you know, excel at what they do. Like flexibility is, is the way to go. I, I truly believe that. And there's a lot of great team members that do do their best work at night, mm-hmm. some of them on the weekend. And at first you're yeah. like, that's not healthy. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if people want to do their work when they don't have customers calling them yeah, and yeah. colleagues bumping into them, um, <laughs> it's it's their prerogative as long as they're not burning themselves out Monday yeah. to Friday as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's cool. And uh, we, we were talking before the show about um, innovative ways to remotely onboard team members with mm-hmm. with today's technologies and approaches. So tell me a little bit more about your tips and tricks in that space. Sure. Um, so I mentioned the README before, which is like very, uh-huh. um, I think a very good kind of welcoming document and also just helps eliminate a lot of questions that someone new might have, right? And, and be maybe nervous to ask. Another thing I would say is to just have an onboarding document that's very specific to your team. So HR will almost always have, or they should have something, right, to onboard that person, but having something very specific to your team. So like, when do you have team meetings? Who's on the team? What are they working on? Um, yeah. What are some acronyms you might hear around the office? Um, what are Who are some cross-functional partners who you might want to meet who work very closely with our team? So just having that key document, I think, goes a long way. And I'd also say, make sure to meet with new teammates, remote teammates, every day. And I know this can be hard to do with our busy schedules, but every day until they feel comfortable not meeting every day, at least, you know, even for a few minutes, because yeah, remotely, I mean, you, you don't get that immediate feedback passing each other in the office or saying, you know, hello, like, you know, asking how things are going. And so that, that initial everyday meeting, I think is really key in making people feel uh, more welcome and just um, a little bit more confident with, you know, their work and just how they're onboarding. I love that. I've never heard that one before, Lorraine. Really? But okay. I love that. Um, nice. <laughs> and it's like one of those ones that I'm kicking myself. I'm like, why haven't I been doing that with some <laughs> of my remote employees? <laughs> because you're right. It's 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 lonely and scary when you start mm-hmm. a new job. Yeah. Um, do you think that's just the sort of manager report relationship or can that be a team effort? Can you have like, hey, Andrew, make sure you're catching up with Jenny every day this week just as she's settling in and they're just peers. I think so. And I think that you touch on um, another thing that I've done before is creating a buddy program. So you have a a designated, you know, teammate and they're that person you can ask all the random questions to that you might not want to bother your manager with. Maybe you're nervous to ask your manager. Um, Things like, you know, do people work around the holidays? Like (laughs) things like that. Like what's the culture? Um, So yeah, I think having a buddy is great. I think, yeah, if other teammates are able to and open to it, like meeting 
with someone, a new person every day would be great. Like just makes them feel more welcome and just get up to speed more quickly. Yeah, that's very cool. I love the buddy systems. And uh, it also makes me think about some of the other fun stuff. Like we've done a few, there's a tool called Kahoot and you can do like um, almost like a pub quiz format Yeah, and you can all get on teams. And so sometimes it's not just about the work, it's about creating a bit of play for those remote and hybrid workers. You know what you should try? Um, two ideas. So one, they have um, remote escape rooms, like led by no way. someone. Yeah, like someone in person. Well, I've seen actually a few different kinds. The ones we did, there was a literal person in an escape room and like <laughs> panning the video around <laughs> and being like, what do you want me to pick up? That would um, frustrate me. I couldn't do that one. Yeah, there's there's a more like, I think more expensive, like elaborate ones where they actually like integrate virtual and just like use like Google Maps and like street view and just like it's a lot more um, comprehensive. So you can reach out to me later if you're interested. My um, husband's company did something like that. And then there's a lot of um, murder mystery games that you can download from Etsy that are not too much at all. Um, So those I've done quite a few um, with remote teams and those have been fun. How fun. Thank you for those tips. I'll take those up. Uh, Very cool. So my final question for you, um, as you're helping professionals and teams, you know, build their professional presence, build their networking, Mm -hmm. create happier and more productive ways to work together. uh, And as you continue to see just the way technology flourishes, um, what is your hope for the future of teamwork? What do you hope that individuals and teams start to enjoy more um, Mm -hmm. in the in the years ahead? Yeah, I think the flexibility piece is big. I think also I would love to see more companies supporting their employees and building their own personal brands. I Mm. think a lot of companies still get nervous. And if someone has a brand, they're thinking, oh, my gosh, is this person like trying to leave our company? Like, what's going on? Are they looking for a new job because they updated their LinkedIn? And it's not that it's you can have a personal brand. And if you have a great personal brand, it it just does wonders for the company. Like for me, I started building my brand. I got asked to do podcasts. I got asked to speak. And yeah. always the company name was promoted alongside my name, right? And yeah. so um, just being supportive in that way and not being nervous that it's something that will make them leave. And it's just a way to also enhance, make the, empower the employee and also you know help build company awareness, brand visibility in a positive, organic way. Yeah. I think that's a great point. And and actually, I'd add to that, which is it's not just external. Like in some of these large corporations, mm-hmm. you look at Jenny and what she's done at yeah, Google. Yeah. Um, there, there are very clear ways that teams within corporations can benefit from knowing who, you know, key people are across the organization, not just their regular teammates yeah. that they might be able to collaborate with and bounce off based on their various passions and expertise. Yeah. Yeah, and that actually reminds me. There was an opportunity at work. Like I got asked to participate in a media roundtable because they knew mm-hmm. I was doing more public speaking, right? If if I hadn't put myself out there and been out there in the world, like I might have not gotten that internal opportunity and I could add yeah. that in my performance review and, you know, just just get more visibility yeah. internally that way. Yeah. And that brings a bit more fun to everyone too. Yeah. <laughs> Gets you out of the routine. A little bit of variety is good for yeah, everyone. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> no, that's, that's really neat. Well, Lorraine, it's been a wonderful conversation. Um, thank you for coming onto the show and sharing your uh, expertise and, and passions. Uh, if any of our listeners want to uh, find uh, any of your uh, learning courses mm-hmm. on LinkedIn or with Stanford Continuing Studies, um, or, or you know, engage you in your new business, mm-hmm. um, how do they best find you? So you can find me on LinkedIn. So just search Lorraine K. Lee and I'll pop up. Or you can also um, subscribe to my newsletter, which is the QR code here. And you can also send me a note at contact at LorraineKaylee.com if you prefer. Awesome, Lorraine. That's wonderful. And I'll make sure we put a note um, in the show for Alicia to share your readme, your uh, personal music. Oh, yes, music great. <laughs> that, I, I think they're brilliant. We use those in our teams and uh, oh, yours great. sounds a little bit more uh, complete than, than perhaps the template that we're using. So oh. I'd love to compare and I'm sure so many of Yeah, I would love to see yours too. as well. I'll ask Alicia to send me a copy. Yeah, we'll do it. All right. Thanks again, Lorraine. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Remember that by embracing vulnerability, trusting our intuition, and approaching challenges with compassion, 
We not only strengthen our teams, but also pave the way for a future where collaboration thrives. If you're hungry for more insights, strategies, and research on collaboration, head over to thefutureofteamwork.com. There, you can join our mailing list to stay updated with the latest episodes and get access to exclusive content tailored to make your team thrive. Together, we can build the future of teamwork. Until next time.